I'm Matthew Davis. Um, I'm the co-founder of Subset Games. I'm primarily a programmer designer for the studio. I say studio, but there's only three of us full time right now. And we made FTL and Into Breach. What was your first year of development like? Do you have any uh, experience beforehand or was FTL your like, first ever attempt at a big project? It was our first attempt at a project on our own. Um, both Jay and I worked at 2K Games in Shanghai, um, hmm. which is where we met. It was my first job out of university. Um, I wanted to get in the game industry and every programmer in the US anyway, once you get into the game industry, it feels like. And so it was a challenge to do that. Um, and my willingness to move out to China and join the 2K China studio was an opportunity for me to get in my foot in the door um, that was actually possible. And so I ended up there, which is where I met Jay. Um, I wasn't at 2K for very long. I probably only about two years before um, we left and started just poking at side projects and other things. And FTL kind of came out of it. Um, the first year was very pleasant. It was very easy. It was an amazing amount of just getting to wake up and work for yourself on your own ideas. It was an amazing shift from the studio. Living in China is incredibly affordable. So you can live on what meager savings I had um, quite easily when you're in Shanghai because of the cost of living. Um, though toward the end of the project, my, my now wife was also fortunately available to be helpful and to still have a job to cover rent in the, in the months before the Kickstarter launched. Um, but mostly, yeah, it was not a particularly stressful development and it, and it all came together far better than it should have and ever had any right to. Um, we really did just feel like we got lucky and stumbled into something that, um, now that I've done more development since and seen how painful development can be, like Into the Breach was a long, drawn out, difficult process. And our current prototypes have been long, drawn out, difficult processes. And so FTL fell together in such a wonderful way that um, it will always be probably a highlight in terms of what game development can be like. How long was FTL in development for? Um, beginning to end probably only took about 18 months. Really? You're the yeah. third guy telling me uh, 18 months, you know? People, uh, apparently 18 months is like a good I, amount of time for a game. I guess if it's a small game and the concept works pretty much from the beginning, then it's all you need to flush it out. Um, and to be fair, when you talk about FTL today, there's the advanced edition content and that took us another, um, probably another year of work to do all the new events, all the new ships, all the new systems, all the new elements that we put into the advanced edition. Um, and so the final product, the, buy and play today is more like two and a half years of development. Um, but still compare that to Into the Breach, which was nearly a five year project. Um, you, uh, so we went from 18 months to five years and it was <laughs> quite a difference. Quite a difference. Yeah. Hang on. I'll, I'll lift my cat. She either wants food or to be lifted and <laughs> I'm going to feel like lifting. Uh, unrelated to the interview, like you managed to launch ftl on steam before steam greenlight before a bunch of the yeah yeah we were very lucky again a common thread for the conversation will be we were very lucky and that that is something that i will say a lot um when it comes to steam specifically what had happened is that ftl had a kickstarter um about eight months i think before we launched and it did much better than than we expected and that drew the attention of the press because um we happened to launch our Kickstarter within two weeks, a week of Double Fine's Kickstarter for their Broken Age. Yeah, Broken Age. Um, and that one drew in like $2 million or $3 million or some ridiculous number. And it got all the gaming press talking about Kickstarter and talking about Broken Age. And then Kickstarter and the, like beneath the project says, here's other projects you might like. And at the time, Kickstarter didn't really have a lot of video games on it. Um, mm. We were an oddity, and so we were always listed right there on this incredibly successful <laughs> Kickstarter. And so we were driven a hell of a lot more traffic than we ever expected to. And 
also because of that, the, the press had eyeballs on it more than we expected to. And so by the time we finished the Kickstarter and it was a success and we we're lining up for release, um, Steam, I, I wasn't actually involved with it. Jay met with them in GDC um, that same year. And Steam was like, you don't even have to ask. Like, of course, you guys can be on Steam because of the success of the Kickstarter and the press we were already getting. Awesome. And yeah, it was, it's ridiculous because during that time, we were like the only game that launched on the day that we launched. And there were like one or two other games that launched in the same week that we launched, as opposed to the 100 games that come out a day or whatever dumb number it is now on Steam. I uh, had a conversation with the lead programmer behind Dead Cells and he mentioned that a lot of what he did was also just, it's not like game design cheating uh, in a sense that like you tell, you're telling the player that something will definitely happen uh, or you give, use the example he gave. Um, he talked about uh, the chests in uh, Dead Cells, that if you leave an area with like a bunch of coins just scattered, the game will remember that, and when you break chests, it'll give you more coins. Mm -hmm. like, it makes the game, um, I'm not sure if the answer is fairer, but more satisfying for the player without the player noticing. Yes. How much of that do you think makes game, like, do you think that, I I've had a conversation with a friend uh, yesterday after the, the Dead Cells thing, about this specific like specifically and i wanted to ask you do you think that stuff like that is the magic sauce behind making good games great because it works on the perception of the player rather than um, on the game itself i think that it is a tool that people can use and is completely valid to use um it's a tool that we don't use very often or we use it incredibly sparingly and i think it comes from again my my board game um drive and the amount of board games i play and the, how much i like board game design um board games are not doing that like when you shuffle the deck the deck you get is the deck you get and it and, and it's not going to compensate and when it does compensate it's clear to the player it's stuff like there might be a mechanic in a game that if you miss a lot then you shuffle in a beneficial card into a deck to m help make up for it and you see those odds changing um and i've always liked transparent design like that and i like that if the player is being benefited the player knows it like we're not pretending otherwise the, the, the game is is upfront and honest with you is a design philosophy that i generally run with when i can in into the breach nftl do not fudge number of roles behind the scenes that 10 percent chance to survive is genuinely 10 percent. It's, it's not secretly 50 percent when you're when it's going to be a game over moment i know that some game developers do do that on a game main more over a moment or on a health bar is very low really that last one percent of your health bar represents ten percent of your health bar that kind of and i can appreciate it it makes sense it does create that player experience um and i've got nothing against other developers doing that but for me i prefer the honesty of the system and that the player is up against a static system and that the challenge is just the game is presenting this preset challenge and you are um, playing against it and there's no wiggle room between. And when you beat it, it's you've beaten the system that is structured in a static way. It's pointless philosophy in terms of what makes that a better game or not. Um, and I, it's not like I, yeah, I, I don't stand by it as the only way to make games. Um, it's probably again, a silly way to do it, but it's, it's always been the way that we chased it down. There are exceptions to that. You obviously can't just purely randomize things and never alter a game based on player behavior. But the only, the strongest example, the biggest element that we did for that was in Into the Breach. The enemy spawning is highly dependent on the current state of things. The, how many enemies are not on the map hugely influences how many spawn and the types of enemies that are present influences the types of enemies that spawn. And we, the game has to be structured to keep a certain amount of enemies of a certain type on the board at all times in order for the challenge to work. Too many enemies in one direction, the game becomes impossible and that's not fun. Too few enemies and the game becomes trivial and that's not fun. And so the spawn rate is very tightly controlled. But other than that, we, I would be hard pressed to think of other examples of the games that we've made hiddenly modifying results based on player um, status. Okay, cool. And maybe we should have. 
the a complaint that I see a lot on FTL, for example, is that um, the game can be highly dependent on how many, on finding a store to find repairs or to find new weapons. And maybe we should have had a mechanic where when you're super low on health, I bump up the odds of throwing in hidden store for people to find um, and to negate that complaint. But um, it's just not how we make games. <laughs> What's your game building process? It is very much, yeah, programmer art nonsense for the early prototypes. They're, they're both blocky messes. Um, for FTL, we spent, it was probably the first six months of development before we really knew what we were doing with it. Um, like the very, very earliest prototype was just a ship on the screen with little circles for crew, crew members that could run around and like put out fires and it was just an infinite asteroid field that would continually damage your ship and you would have to repair it put out fires just it's kind of um in the end would have felt a little bit like a um overcooked or like some sort of just this plate spinning game without much more to it no combat even um and then when we added combat we tried to do like well, like huge fleets where you could zoom out and control the ship and zoom back in and I don't know if, how aware of FTL you are, but the final product is just a static ship still on the screen. You're not actually controlling movement at all. Um, and we spent a bunch of time on that and tossed it out and went back to just a static screen, and figured out this kind of weird combination of being able to do the enemies, but keep things pretty abstract without any actual movement. And that's a good reflection on how we do it. Like when we sit down to make the game, we're not really 100% sure what the game is yet. Like it's more, we've got a rough concept of something we think would be fun. For FTL, it was, um, we were inspired a lot by some board games that did crew management and things like that on spaceships, which video games mostly hadn't done. And so we were wondering what it would be like to make a video game that focused on the crew instead of the piloting. And it kind of, after iteration and screwing around with it, we stumbled upon what the final game became. became. There were things like, Power management that we're interested in as a mechanic and the crew management, obviously. But there were kind of vague ideas along with, um, we knew we wanted it to be hard. We knew we were running with the kind of the roguelike design from the beginning. It was the, a space we wanted to play in. Um, Splunky was a big inspiration for that, as well as some of the classic roguelikes. And, but we, the benefit of when you're only a two person team is that we can just start prototyping, throwing stuff on the screen and checking if it's fun and ditching it and trying again and doing that quickly without burning a lot of money, without burning a lot of time because we don't have a whole studio behind us waiting for us to get going and be able to start on sales, start on art, start on all the other stuff that needs to go into the game. Um, and the same process occurred with Into the Breach, but it just took a hell of a lot longer. So instead of those six months, eight months of prototyping, it was more like, two to three years of prototyping. Um, we were designing like entire meta strategy sections. Like, you know how the final version is just the islands you're jumping between. And it's yeah. pretty much just bare bones mission to mission. But it originally had, um, we did two or three different versions of full city management with rebuilding buildings and upgrading buildings. Um, or different cities and you had to move between the cities and the end, it's kind of a pandemic like thing where monsters would build up threat in some cities and you have to chase them down and put it out. And then you're juggling plates on a meta strategy as well on the combat side. Um, and we just did these different versions over and over until we found something that we, that we liked. And even within the combat, like that idea of, you know what the enemy is doing has a, a spectacular amount of knock-on effects to how a tactics game would work and finding all those corner cases of how you need to design maps for it how you can apply player abilities that make sense in that context um when you can just run it run away from an enemy and so many elements that we had to iterate on see what failed and try again and try again and try again and it does within the breach more than anything it kind of showed me that there's an element of game design and game development at least for us that it is a factor of the time you have to be able to pound in an idea and not every studio has that time because they have bills to pay and they need to get something out the door 
how much patience do you think people need as a as game developers? I think that is a, a excellent question. Um, I think a lot, um, but I do know other developers that are less patient, and even Jay is less patient than I am um, when it comes to that process of pounding at it until it comes out. Um, I'm still a relatively, I think it's more stubborn than patience when it comes to just pounding at it until it comes together. But um, yeah, I, I suppose not everybody would have the mental um, space to be able to do that. It's not necessarily the most fun way to make something, but it can be frustrating. It, it, it is true. And I think for a lot of people, um, the attachment to work already done is very difficult. And it's they very difficult to say, I am comfortable abandoning these four months of work or these six months of work um, because I think that it can be better. Like that is a, a, a sort of an emotional hurdle, I think, for a lot of de developers that wouldn't be something they could fall into easily as a development strategy. When should you make the decision to throw away stuff you've already made? If you think like, I think I, this isn't exactly what, this isn't exactly working, but maybe if I keep at it, it'll work someday. Like I, when should you? It's, that's the challenge. Yeah. And that's why some things take forever is that you don't know when to dump it. And I can't even say I was right in when we dump stuff. Like maybe there was a version of End of the Breach with that city management that would have, if we'd spent another four months, would have come together and would have turned into something amazing. Um, but it is, it's impossible to know that you did the right thing or that when the right time to do that is. Um, I would say sooner rather than later, because you're only going to grow more attached to something. Um, but while I say that, none of this has been us abandoning a game. Like, Into the Breach involved abandoning a lot of elements and mechanics around the game. But there was a core idea to the game that we believed in that we didn't abandon. Um, and it's hard to distinguish those two things. Like, maybe it would have made more sense to just make six prototypes completely different games rather than one prototype and then stubbornly force that to become something. Like, it's a combination of not giving up on one idea while being willing to give up on every idea that comes along with it until you make that one idea work. Can I ask about your process to trying to find if something works and like why it doesn't work or why it does work? Like if something doesn't um, work, what do you do? We play test a lot on ourselves. Like the, the vast majority of our decision making is just that we play the game. If we are enjoying the game, then we're more likely to keep it. Um, there is an element of we are impatient in the way that you're talking about before in that we needed to be fun quite quickly. And we have found that we are faster and better developers when we have a small idea that we can build up from a small fun base and kind of keep putting pieces on that just make it more fun rather than needing to like if you're making civilization or you're making that meta game for into the breach or whatever like that you can't make civilization fun in a week you need that you need to spend nine months a year or whatever building up that really big complicated machine and then press go and 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 hope and that it works. Um, while it's easier to build up something like Splunky from a small piece, like just the movement in Splunky is fun. You make a quick little platformer and then you add an enemy and then you add a new type of trap and then you add a new, and you can just kind of, you take that core kernel that's immediately fun and you can stack on top of it. Either you personally had or you and Jay had and how you overcame it. It's just probably not going to be a satisfying answer. It's just a design problem that we solved. <laughs> it's um, the in Into the Breach, um, because it's very deterministic, the enemy's attacks are predetermined. Your attacks always hit and always do the same amount of damage. Um, you end up in a scenario where you get a turn that you can't win. Like, you can't avoid the damage. It's inevitable. Um, and because of the core structure of the game and with the health bar and the way that we actually ended up making the game function um was that that would mean you could find yourself in a guaranteed loss scenario but you haven't technically lost yet like you're on a turn you know when you hit that end turn button you're gonna lose um and there's nothing you can do and i think that is a horrible state to put the player in 
um, and that is a state that we really struggled with because the kind of the core design philosophy of the game was that deterministic nature that we're going to reduce the die rolls reduce the randomness ftl was a huge random number generator design so many misses and randomness and random events and random things that could happen well into the breach we really focused it in and wanted to make a much more controlled experience um but then the only thing that could solve that problem was to completely buck that core design philosophy and add in the power grid defense concept with the you have like a 10 percent chance of avoiding damage and so that little like you have a 10 percent chance of nothing happening made the game work in the, in that it let you escape those completely guaranteed fail states there was always a chance that no matter how dire things are in the breach you're still probably gonna lose when you hit end turn but at least you can hope and watch that turn and experience the full narrative that you've created without it just being this miserable hit end turn experience and then the 10 percent of the time that it works and you don't die also gives that player that amazing moment of like barely scratching through um, and so it was a, I think it's an interesting example in that it is a compromise that had to be made for the kind of the core design philosophy of the game, but it was invaluable to being able to make the game function and that without it, I don't think the game would work as well. I, uh, had a conversation with the lead programmer behind Dead Cells and he mentioned that a lot of what he did was also just, it's not like game design cheating. Uh, in a sense that, like, you tell, you're tell you telling the player that something will definitely happen, uh, or you give, use the example he gave. Um, he talked about uh, the chests in uh, Dead Cells, that if you leave an area with, like, a bunch of coins just scattered, the game will remember that, and when you break chests, it'll give you more coins. Mm -hmm. Like, it makes the game... Um, I'm not sure if the answer is fairer, but more satisfying for the player without the player noticing. Yes. How much of that do you think makes game? Like, do you think that I, I've had a conversation with a friend uh, yesterday after the the dead cells thing about this specific, like specifically, and I wanted to ask you: Do you think that stuff like that is the magic sauce behind making good games great because it works on the perception of the player rather than um... on the game itself? I think that it is a tool that people can use and is completely valid to use. Um, it's a tool that we don't use very often, or we use it incredibly sparingly. Um, and I think it comes from, again, my, my board game um, drive and the amount of board games I play and the, how much I like board game design. Um, board games are not doing that. Like when you shuffle the deck, the deck you get is the deck you get and, it, and, it, and it's not going to compensate. When it does compensate, um, it's clear to the player. It's stuff like there might be a mechanic in a game that if you miss a lot, then you shuffle in a beneficial card into a deck to help make up for it. And you see those odds changing. Um, and I've always liked transparent design like that. And I like that if the player is being benefited, the player knows it. Like we're not pretending otherwise. The, the game is, is upfront and honest with you, is a design philosophy that I generally run with when I can. Um, in into the breach and ftl do not fudge number rolls behind the scenes um that 10 percent chance to survive is genuinely 10 percent. it's it's not secretly 50 percent when you're when it's going to be a game over moment i know that some game developers do do that on a game over, over moment or on a health bar is very low really that last one percent of your health bar represents 10 percent of your health bar that kind of and i can appreciate it it makes sense it does create that player experience um, and I've got nothing against other developers doing that, but for me, I prefer the honesty of the system and that the player is up against a static system and that the challenge is just the game is presenting this preset challenge and you are um, playing against it and there's no wiggle room between. And when you beat it, it's, you've beaten the system that is structured in a static way. Um, it's pointless philosophy in terms of what makes that a better game or not. Um, and I, it's not like I, yeah, I, I don't stand by it as the only way to make games. Um, it's probably, again, a silly way to do it. But it's it's always been the way that we chased it down. There are exceptions to that. Um, you obviously can't just 
purely randomize things and never alter a game based on player behavior. Um, but the only, the strongest example, the biggest element that we did for that was in Into the Breach. Um, the enemy spawning is highly dependent on the current state of things. The how many enemies are not on the map hugely influences how many spawn. Um, and the types of enemies that are present influences the types of enemies that spawn. And we the game has to be structured to keep a certain amount of enemies of a certain type on the board at all times in order for the challenge to work. Too many enemies in one direction, the game becomes impossible, and that's not fun. Too few enemies, and the game becomes trivial, and that's not fun. And so the spawn rate is very tightly controlled. Um, but other than that, we I would be hard-pressed to think of other examples of the games that we've made hiddenly modifying results based on player um, status. Okay, cool. Ooh. And maybe we should have. Like a complaint that I see a lot on FTL, for example, is that um, the game can be highly dependent on how many, on finding a store to find repairs or to find new weapons. Um, and maybe we should have had a mechanic where when you're super low on health, I bump up the odds of throwing in hidden store for people to find um, and to negate that complaint. But um, it's just not how we make games. <laughs> I'm always very reluctant to give like explicit advice to other developers or, or studios. Um, I'm aware that the way we make games is not necessarily typical and that um, this stuff isn't always transferable. And it, there's an element, I think, when it comes to game development is it is art. And every artist has their own approach to how they do their craft and how they create what they want to make and everyone kind of has to stumble their way through the process that's going to work for them rather than just trying to wholesale take something from another studio implement it in your studio and say it worked for them so it's going to work for us um it's the same it, you can draw a direct analogy to that doesn't work in game design either you can't take a mechanic straight from one game and toss it into your game and have it work like it it that mechanic is always dependent on all the other parts in the game for the game to be fun um, and one element of how we run our studio is probably dependent on all the other ways that who we are and the games we make and who we work with, that it works that way. And that if you, you can't just transplant it somewhere else for it to work. But yes, I do believe that absolute faith in the people you're working with is important and, um, re respecting and, and listening to and supporting each other is more important than the like whatever the final product is um it should be something everyone's pleased with by the time you get to the end um and when i hire people like more or a new programmer for just pure raw technical knowledge versus like ben prunty our composer if anything ben prunty our composer complains that um jay and i don't give him enough feedback um because we just trust him to make great music and that he sometimes feels a little bit afloat in terms of how to apply what would fit for our game. Or we're like, we're not the composer. You you can sort it out. We trust you make something awesome. And most of the time, I mean, every time, if you look at Into the Breach and FTL, his soundtracks are absolutely genius. Amazing. Um, so uh, there is an element that you just have to be like, these people you work with are talented and you need to let them be talented and trust them to be talented. Yeah, advice to students either looking to get into the games industry or looking to build a, a studio? Um, my number one advice when I'm asked is to be wary of advice. But that's the thing I always want to push the hardest from the beginning. Like I talked about earlier already in the interview, the need to kind of sort yourself out and your own path and your own approach to this stuff, I think is incredibly important. Um, and that no one's, the, their path is not applicable to everyone else's. Like it's just, you can't copy and paste this stuff. And so any advice you do here, take with a grain of salt. And then um, when it comes to like the generalities that I also like are um, the only reason I'm in the industry is because I was willing to move to China and, um, and kind of disrupt my whole life, leave friends and family behind and start in the industry in a weird place. I'm not saying everybody's got to move to China, but there is a certain amount of it's not going to be the path you expect. 
you're not going to be able to just do exactly what you want to do and you picture in your mind. It's going to be a certain amount of if you want to make games or you want to do anything in your life, you need to be able to roll with the punches and kind of chase down the opportunities where they are, even if they aren't exactly what you always wanted to do. Um, as well as the other element that I was already discussing in terms of trusting your team and your and whoever you're working with, as well as like really respecting them and their time and their um, emotional state or health state or whatever it might be that you don't you can't work in a team if you're not all supporting one another and you're not trusting one another and that's been a, a big part of subset game success i think is that we are lucky enough to be in a position that we all do that <laughs>